Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Chattamorphium Theater virtual screening room. I'm Kevin McLean. And once again, we're with Chris Suido, uh, film director. Um, we just are running, uh, finishing up a run of his uh, documentary, Eye on the 60s, which uh, we loved. It's one of our favorites here at the theater. And one of, uh, I think you were one of the first um, directors to contact me. And, um, and I think it was one of the first director hosted films that we did was Eye on the 60s. So um so that was special so that's special and i'm glad and people like it people really people have really enjoyed it so we decided to add more so we're going to um go with another documentary you did um and and the other two documentaries that you have done are on a different a completely different kind of genre and they're more uh, they're automobile based um they're car automobile based but they're not car movies per se um, there, there are much bigger arcs and themes um, in, in the films, in the documentaries, and especially on the one that we're debuting on Friday, which is um, A Gullwing at Twilight. Um, and it's about uh, the driver, John Finch. And it's, you know, it, it really, uh, again, you have an, a, a wonderful behind the scenes documentary, which I highly recommend people, we'll put that up on our website as well. I highly recommend people look at that. Um, you give context within the, um, the making of kind of like what you were looking for. And Bonneville is just a fantastic place, um, you know, to shoot, right? I mean, what, you know, I guess my first question is, is, is the other documentaries, including this one, was, was your goal to do a car themed movie or was it the individuals within the, that, that kind of grabbed you or was it the combination of both? For me, it's always about the uh, sense of adventure that people have. And uh, it's about self-determination of taking a talent somewhere and, and serving as an example that everybody's got a, a, a story to tell and a message behind that story. <clears throat> and, um, you know, with John, he had had this, John Fitch uh, was a, a racer from the 1950s. He was a, a war hero, even a P-51 pilot. And it, 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 I mean, it's a it's a really big story, but it, he's the descendant of the steamboat inventor. It's not Robert Fulton. It's actually John Fitch. And oh, it's wow. he was like 15, 20 years before Robert Fulton. So John was born with this uh, innate uh, ability to uh, create things and to think in terms of mechanical. <clears throat> and uh, at, at any rate, he was shot down in World War II uh, uh, in a P-51 Mustang on a strafing run of a, of a train. And uh, he would declare that was his fault because <laughs> he, he went back for seconds. And uh, but he had a, like a month or two before shot down this German jet, which was the first jet ever, a 262 Messerschmitt. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, he landed in a field. He had his arm broken and these little kids found him. They put him in a barn. And, uh, you know, we only touch on this. <clears throat> but anyway, he gets out. He's liberated. OK, because there's like a few months left. And the irony of John Fitch is that about set, six, seven years later, he's now got this deal with Mercedes where he's, he's worked it out for himself to be a racer on their team, which includes Juan Fangio and uh, a, a Sterling Moss. And, and, and he always says, well, I, yeah, I, I, was a, I was a guest of the German government. <laughs> and, you know, and now I'm driving. Right? It was a nice way to say you're a prisoner of war. <laughs> yeah. That's what he was, very affable guy. And, you know, he invented the thing he's known for in terms of its, his impact on people's lives is the yellow barrels that people crash into on the highway uh, was John's invention. And he had, uh, after watching, uh, you know, they used to race on the sand at Daytona before they went into the, you know, the, the Daytona 500. <clears throat> and and I, I don't know the whole history, but you'd see these terrible crashes on these guys rolling in the sand and they'd get out like no big deal. Well, as the energy gets, uh, it's rather than you hit a pole or a guardrail, your body's gonna take it. If you hit, you know, the sand, I mean, the, the energy gets absorbed in the particles. So his idea was like, oh, I'm gonna take the beach and put it on the American highway. And he put it in, in these special, uh, uh, canisters, which you see these yellow barrels, and they're a, a, a Union Carbide actually designed the, the, you know, the canister. And John was on his living room 
the floor and on its kitchen table, doing all the, ma the mathematics about how many you would need, first, what kind of car, the weight, et cetera, and how fast you'd go and how many you'd need. And the first one, <clears throat> so anyway, he, he would get these cars and get uh, uh, crates and fill them with sand and crash them at Lime Rock on Sundays. <laughs> and people were like, what the hell is this guy doing? Like a, he, he, he was known crash test dummy, basically. Yeah, he was. I mean, he didn't have any money. He got this. And, <laughs> and you know, it was tested in 1969 down in Bridgeport, Connecticut at an airport. And all these dignitaries, highway people, they came and they're going to laugh about it. What's this? And all of a sudden, they were ramming these all kinds of cars at intense speeds. And these guys are getting out, waving to the crowd. It's like, okay, maybe the, the guy says it works. And so the first one was put in... Uh, Interstate 84 and 91 in Hartford. And uh, there's a little bit of a joke behind it that the first like 10 guys that hit it happened to be of Hispanic descent. And Hartford is, you know, big Puerto Rican community, but it's, his, uh, his lawyer said, or the, excuse me, there was the, the highway safety guy in Connecticut, the commissioner called him and says, you've created the ultimate Puerto Rican lifesaver. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. I can't even probably imagine how many people Oh, okay. Lives he has saved with just that. I mean, yeah. nationwide, probably worldwide, because I would imagine they yeah. use those things all over the world at this point. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's times when he was alive, I'd be talking to him on the phone, coming to Cape Cod when, and I lived in Connecticut and going through Rhode Island. I, and I see them on the, I hear I'm talking to the guy on the phone and, hey, John, there's, see, I see these, their barrels are at exit four and, uh, you know, in Rhode Island, he goes, oh, how many are there? And this and that. And he goes, you know, it, it was just so fun because he was, he was always trying to improve everything he invented. But the thing that really was his life was racing. And uh, uh, he right. became a hero to, to guys who are do-it-yourselfers and whatnot. And, and he was a very sophisticated type of guy. So and, the documentary is yeah. focusing basically on later in his life. He had a very accomplished racing life i mean you know i mean oh, yeah. he won tons of stuff i mean that's a whole history and i encourage people it's way too long to get into i encourage people to look it up on wikipedia um, i mean just you know an amazing racing career and it you know land speed records and he continued on and so the film takes us out to bonneville so talk a second about bonneville and shooting out there and kind of what goes on out there? I mean, it's a whole culture world that goes on out there. It's fascinating. Well, first of all, I was, I, I thought about here he is still alive and I get him, I, I have a chance to get him, maybe the only person to get him actually problem solving around a race car because you can't go back to the 50s and make the documentary again. But here he is now and it's, it's the 2000s and he's going to Bonneville to uh, an invitation of a guy that owned a Mercedes Gullwing Mercedes going is arguably the most beautiful car ever made. And we'll, you know, the just on a side note, it is doors come up. So anyway, so at Bonneville, I so can't he's imagine you know, how much that car's worth. Uh, there's there, are, I think a couple thousand of them main made, and they're they're worth a little bit. If you own one, you're you're a pretty lucky guy. Yeah, I bet. But but uh, so he had said he was going out to Bonneville. I was doing a, a short piece on him for a tribute at Lime Rock Park, which he helped create in in Western Connecticut, the, the great racetrack. And that's how I met him because I did a film about that. So uh, he goes, uh, well, I'm coming out to Bonneville and you ought to come film me. And, and, I, and I did, I'm, and I, I just needed a few shots of him because here he is still active. At that point he was 86. And I was immediately taken by the space in the place. And it's almost like a big white uh, board. It's like, here's, here's your, you know, the canvas. Oh, oh, you know, yeah. Like, yeah, that this is, it's white and you get to do what you, you know, it's any story can be told there. It seems mostly science fiction stories and car stories and, you know, the, a lot of supermodels and stuff. Get make shot Mad Max out there. Yeah. That kind yeah, of thing. That kind of thing. Yeah. Sure. And, and so it's, it's alien. It's uh, you, you get totally taken out of yourself. It's also hot. And so, and the reverse angle of filming something happens to be like, a mile away so you know you will get one angle you got to go around all the way around to get the car coming this way and that way and things are not happening at this the pace you want them there everyone's in this like flotation mode and they're all working on their cars and everybody's in their space and you look at the mountains it's an ancient lake bed and, and go where you know where am i what 
what and what the hell kind of a film am I going to make? <laughs> this place is way bigger than, than than I am. But I said, let's focus on the individuals, and the individuals are you know are trying to break a class record of a certain kind of sports car and certain kind of engine, and that's why he he was there. He was invited to do this, but but Bonneville, when you you, you see it <clears throat> on the highway, you you know it's iconic. Because you know, when you're a kid and you heard about the Green Monster and the Spirit of America, the the the, the rocket cars, uh, it it's it just gets a hold of you if you care about that kind of thing. And it's it's on the Nevada border with with uh, with Utah. So on one side of a parking lot, you can have you can park in you know Utah where it's you know next to godliness, and then you. Right, <laughs> feet in Utah, and there's the, there's yeah, the, the, bad, there's the same casino, coin, right? The casino, <laughs> it's literally, uh, it's and they also uh, tested the uh, fl the flyers, the atomic bomb at the Wendover. Uh, they trained there at the Wendover Air Force Base, uh, which has a little museum. So there's there's all this stuff going on, and and it's uh it's cosmic, Kevin. <laughs> yeah, no, and 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 to, and you really get you really get drawn into the landscape because it's almost yeah. like you know shooting on the moon or shooting in any kind of like <clears throat> bizarre landscape. You know, even though you make you you do you focus on the individuals, but just the dramatic background and every angle, and it really um, it becomes a character in in the film. You know, your it really play, is its own character. Your eyes play tricks on you out there, and uh, you know this feeling of like. Uh, yeah, you're a macho guy with a car, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna get, you know, you can take that rental car. <laughs> you're not supposed to take a rental car out there, so it's at this point the statute of limitations is over. Uh, but you, you, so we're gonna go fast in this rental car, and you start to, and you, you know, you, there's no depth perception. You go, wait a minute. Uh, did you do I, that? I, I mean, if, did if, you if get 50 miles an hour? I, I'm thinking I'm gonna hit something, and what? And I'm, I'm not. I'm, there's nothing in front of me, and there's more of a danger of actually falling through. Because of the because uh, of the cross of rain and in, 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 in you know in the condition of the thing you can actually end up in a hole, right. which is disconcerting. Uh, well, but, did you run into any um, sandstorm? I mean, did you? Uh, what were the did, were, what was it like shooting in that environment specifically? Well, they I, I mean I, they have big sandstorms there. I mean, did you well, run? There, into there were some storms that came through. There's no sand there. It's it's all salt, and it looks like ice or or, or snow. And it really, you know, where's the beach? You know, yeah. and there's, there's no beach for hundreds and, you know, how, how many miles, you know, Pacific Ocean is the next beach. <laughs> and that's a ways. Um, it, it forces you to focus on what you need to do because it's so, well, all you got is yourself, your own instinct. And, and, and uh, you know, you're there to do a job <clears throat> and you realize like, what the hell am I doing? This is so uh, forbidding. And uh, at the same point, you know, once you start looking in the viewfinder, it becomes apparent why you're why you're there, what 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 you're doing, and but you still got to get the shots and the plan. In this film, it was about guys trying to go out and enjoy themselves at an elderly age, and to maybe feel young again, and, and you know, to, to perhaps because you love what you do, there could be an elixir. You know, in the case of John, when I first saw him, what attracted me to doing this was now he got out of the. the he drove him in and he got gets out and he's all like you know, hunched over and old <clears throat> and then he's, he's asked him for his opinion on things and about the engine and this oh okay he started to go upright and it was it was a transformation hmm. as now he's going to be the driver his name's on the roof and it's just you know uh and he puts the suit on scratch 20 years put the helmet on and it's like I'm jumping, he's jumping in. It's like, yeah. Well, like, used me of using a, a, a double or somebody, some tall skinny guy and said, you got some young skinny guy to jump in the car before he was going off to try to get this this record, this <clears throat> this record, which really doesn't really amount to much. It was just, the, you know, records. It's the pursuit record. of it. I mean, it's the, you yeah, know. Yeah, it was the, I mean, yeah, the, you're out there and you know, you're not in a cube and you're not, you know, right. you're not suffering uh, in some other, 
aspect of your life that you're not doing what you want to do. Right. So, and everything uh, is about the journey. Everything's about the journey. And, yeah, you know, this, you yeah. know, it reminds me, we showed a documentary called Lives Well Lived. And it was, it was kind of that same concept. It was like, you know, people, you know, in their eighties and nineties still doing amazing things. And, you know, you know, John reminded me of, you know, of, of that, of the people in that film very much, you know, John is probably one of those people like race car drivers and pilots, very focused because I would imagine you have to be a very focused individual to fly um, a, a jet, to drive a car that fast. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, when I'm on the highway, I'm going 70, 80. I'm like, Ugh, you know, I can't well, imagine. He, he always said, this is a good uh, quote, that those who are successful in racing or at a machine, <clears throat> a, a jet or whatever, it's a sensitivity to the loss of control. It's, it's not that you're in control, but you know that that space where you can operate in that not too many people will go to because it's scary. And he would often say, it's gotta be scary. Like uh, uh, they're, they're racing, if you're not, it, you're not trying, if, if, if you're not scared, you're not trying. <laughs> right, right, no, I, right. I mean, I'm sure they push it, they push yeah. the, I mean, that's what they do. They push the pilots, yeah. Race but, card, that's what they do, push the limits. But those that are doing it for a living um, will often say, well, I'm not in it for the adrenaline. I'm not in it necessarily. I mean, I'm here because I happen to be very good at it because I was spotted as a young age. I, I loved it. But, you know, those, those guys that are, if you've ever, you know, I'm in, in my career, I've been in the car with some guys that were really top-notch drivers and famous. <clears throat> and uh, just to watch how they shifted it was a different class of uh, of a, right. a driver to be in. It's not scary at all um, because you know you have confidence in them, and they have confidence, and they have a lot of confidence. They never believe they're going to crash. It's always going to be somebody else, you know. Um, I think you kind of have to have that mentality. I, I would think whether I'm flying a jet or I'm driving a car at 150 miles an hour. You know what I mean? I. I you, I, I would think you, you really can't have those thoughts in your head. No. Because it would, it would be impossible. I, I don't know how you no, it's a, it's also that. an athletic event and it's a competition. So you, and yeah. there's a group of people that you're communicating with and they're trying to help you and, and you, it's, it's mathematical what's happening. There's, there's, I don't think there's a lot of room for the emotion or the fear. It's, it's mostly, it's all about problem solving. And, and that's what you see. And that's what John was. He was a problem solver. Yeah, and even out in Bonneville in this uh, attempt to break a class record with this ex exotic age, ancient sports car, which was a novelty. And everybody saw this thing out there. They're going, what's that doing here? Because mostly they look like rockets and and uh, souped up the uh, hot rods and, you know, every kind of exotic, you know, form of car seems to be out there. Right. And here's this this European 1955 Mercedes. Uh, With an 87 year old driver. Like, what, what is this thing doing? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> it looked very yeah. silly. It, well, it yeah. actually looked, it was silly in some respects, but it was actually pretty cool. <clears throat> Nobody else had a car like that. Yeah, and it's also just fascinating um, just watching, watching people who have a passion and just such a joy of doing something, watching them work together and get involved in it. And just being kind of a fly on the wall in, in something and in a world that, you know, you're not familiar with um, is really, I find fast, is one of the best, that's what's great about documentaries. It yeah. allows, you know, it exposes you to this world and this, this, this unique information um, and told in a wonderful way that makes sense. Um, yeah. And then, and when he retired, so he was, he, he raced cars and then he retired in like 1964. And uh, then he, he, he would have said he never retired, Kevin. <laughs> he never retired. Well, he retired from day-to-day -day racing, but then he went on to uh, manage Lime Rock, right? Which you well, did, was, which yeah, was the other he, film that you did. He, he arrived at Lime Rock about the time it was being built. And he became the first, like the business manager or the, uh, the person in charge of getting all the, the races together. He had a lot of creativity as far as who was going to come. And he had some crazy famous races there uh, that he put on where all these cars of all different types, including a midget, midget racing and an Indy car and a Maserati oh, wow. and a Corvette and a, and a Ferraris were all on the track together. It was called uh, 
Formula Lieb, L-A-B-R-E, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. And it was a free for all. And the midget won the race. <laughs> 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 because Lone Rock's got, a, you know, it's got some, it's, it's only a mile and a half and it has some corners that are very hard to, you have to almost slow down and want to very slow and you come out of one and there's an uphill where you can really floor it. If, if you've got a certain kind of car, you're gonna go airborne. Uh, all this kind of, it's so much variables, but this guy, Roger Ward had won the, the Indy uh, 500 that year. And here he comes out to Lime Rock and he's in this uh, midget and the films are hilarious because these guys are trying, in these big Maseratis are trying to run this guy off the road <laughs> and he won the race. And then he thought he was really onto something. So he took the car to Sebring for the uh, endurance race and he, he got, you know, he got cleaned out because, <laughs> 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 you know, when you need straight ahead speed. Right, the right, you know? he had the right car for the right track. At the, at right, the, exactly, yeah. which is, you know, symbolic of a lot of things in my place. <laughs> That's funny. Well, this seemed like a, a kind of a, uh, uh, a personal film for you. Um, yeah. Well, I, I have always, since I was a little kid, uh, you know, my neighbors, the, the older, the, Grandma Nolan was her name across the street and her husband, and I'd go over there and visit with them. And I always felt really comfortable around older people. And uh, yeah, I love them, you know? And so here was, you know, John and, you know, as we get older, uh, I think I'm a, just a few years older than you, but, uh, you know, you're kind of heading there yourself. And, uh, and that, I will lament that day where somebody says, hey, son, you know, <laughs> honey. And John would do that with me. It's like, oh, well, you know, he'd call me old boy. Oh, old boy, you know. Uh, and he, he was, uh, or he'll say something that would be, you know, well, that I was, you know, 30 or 40 years younger than him. But uh, it, it, it they don't sometimes get a lot of respect in this society and with John he wasn't going to give up and he was going to he was still inventing things and the reason for going out to Bonneville he took this seriously that I'm going to break this record it wasn't the land speed record which is something like 760 miles an hour wow. but I'm gonna you know in a rocket car but <clears throat> he was there was a class that was trying to get like 165 not easy to do in a hot temp temperature so it's at the elevation that they're at and this anything can go wrong in the wind and that, you know and you're driving a car from 1955 yeah. <laughs> but it was the idea the thing about this was that doing what you love was the elixir that kept you young that kept you going and to have him in that environment with that car which is iconic and it was almost like purgatory or something the place you go to before you in a Catholic religion before you get to go to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I remember seeing film strips of purgatory you know, in the first grade. It was, maybe I don't want to talk about that, but at any rate, it had a religious feeling to me to be in this, this place. It, it is biblical. And, uh, you know, when you got this old man in the spaceship of a car and he's writing his own history at the age of 87. Yeah. And uh, it serves as an example for other people to, um, well, look at look at this guy. Look what he's doing. You know, yeah. this, this is cool. It is. Yeah. And that's and that's one of the I think one of the big takeaways of it. And that's it's you know, it's a, it's 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 a it's about a man, you know, yeah. it, it, it's it's set in, a, in, in the automotive world. And, you know, but you're right. It's it's about the man, and and it's a great look um, at someone who's done a lot of great things and um, very well done. And you know, um, we look forward to having it on the virtual screening room. And um, I look so I definitely recommend people check out the behind the scenes. And while you're on the site, you know, we'll probably be doing uh, Lime Rock, uh, but it's also on your website now. So you're more than welcome. I highly recommend going to check out the Lime Rock film. You know, we'll probably um, do another one of these for Lime Rock here uh, in a few weeks, uh, maybe after Christmas. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I enjoy that. Um, yeah, because... Kevin, you didn't ask me if, what, if John liked the film or not. <laughs> oh, did it? Well, I, well, I assumed well, he, he would. Goes, well, um, you know, it goes interesting film you have there. Did you make me look? But you made me look so old. <laughs> and I go, he goes, I'm not that old. <laughs> like really, kind of been out of shape. But look at me. Oh my God, how could you have done that? And like, 
you know, but John, you're in this, getting in this car with this suit and you're, you like the transforming the viewpoints of, you know, you didn't quite see it, but it probably took about 50 people to come up to him because it had to run on public, uh, throughout public television. Right. The John, great job in the film, man. You know, you're an inspiration to millions of people. Oh, I guess I am. I yeah, it. right, right. I got the film and he's had this way of speaking that was very kind of high pitched uh, as he got older. And, uh, but I, you know, in the end, say, well, I guess I'm, and then I went through, through this with Roland on the, well, everybody must like it. I guess, I guess it must be okay. Right. You know, so you're never going to get any uh, satisfaction from your subjects. Don't expect that. Especially in documentaries. The, you know, these people aren't, you know, actors, you know, they're not used to seeing themselves on camera. So yeah, I, I bet yeah. that's a, that could be it's, a, it's a, huge, it's a huge responsibility when you're, you've got someone's life that you now you're going to do this thing and then you have plans you're going to take it to a wider audience yeah and you wouldn't attempt it unless you felt that they had a good story to tell and and that's i i knew i believed in it i knew that i had a great setting i knew that i had a great character i had I a player at play and i knew that i had the significance and the significance is like get out and do what you're supposed to be doing if you love it and and that's and that's really what I wanted the takeaway to be. Well, it, it is. And I think it shows in the film, you know, you, you, you see, you know, you look at him and you go, boy, you know, I really hope when I'm 87, I'm still doing things that I love like that. And it is inspiring. So thank you for making the film. Thank you for letting us show it uh, on our virtual screening room and uh, everybody check it out. A Gullwing at Twilight. And uh, the next one, we will be doing Lime Rock. So we'll be doing that one in a few more weeks. So. Well, appreciate it. Thank you so All much. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Chris. All right. Have a nice day. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks for joining us. And we'll see you next time.